God loves you with an everlasting love. God himself is not just good. He is goodness itself. By that I mean that we don't just describe God as good, but that we describe everything as good that is like unto God. He is the standard against which we measure all things. He is the stabilizing force by which we judge moral matters and spiritual matters. And God and God alone is goodness, is life, is light, is truth. And he is highly exalted, meaning he is above all. He is the all in all. Psalm chapter 107 verse 1 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. God is goodness. And I want to put the truth to you directly. God is goodness. And many of us in this room and many watching online are fighting that goodness by the way they live their lives. They are in enmity with God. They are contradicting by the way they live and think and feel and believe the very essence of the goodness of God, the very nature of who he is. James chapter 1 verse 13 says this. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. In other words, man by his own free will is drawn away by those desires, drawn away to the things of the world, drawn away to the things that contradict the nature of God. And we see... The results of this manifested in our world. The world is being covered in darkness because of sin. You look around at the world today and you wonder what is the issue? What are the problems stemming from? Why is the world in the state that it's in? What is happening on the earth? And I'm reminding you now, as the scripture has said, that this darkness, this chaos, this disorder is the direct result of sin. And sin is rebellion against God who is goodness. Well, if you rebel against light, don't be surprised when you have darkness. If you rebel against holiness, don't be surprised when you have moral filth. If you rebel against truth, don't be surprised when you have confusion. God is that goodness. Verse 15, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. The Bible does declare that all have sinned. There is none righteous. Every living person has violated the holy standard of God by something that they have done or thought, some attitude that they have carried within themselves. There are those who are contradicting God's nature by the way they live. They are enemies with God and they don't even know it. Fighting that goodness, they live their lives in rebellion. Stubborn hearts, prideful demeanors, narrow minds, fixated on that which they desire. They trade the eternal for the temporary, the worldly for the spiritual. Now, verse 16 says, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. This is, of course, talking about the new believer or the believer. But verse 17 tells us that God is the father of lights. No variableness, no shadow of turning. So then sin is the reason for evil, but God is the father of lights. God is love. And that love knows no bound. That love knows no limits. You've ever wondered if you were loved, by your mere existence you can determine that you are loved with an everlasting love. 
For the scripture declares that we were formed in the image of God. If you've ever wondered if anybody cared, the scripture tells us that we can cast our cares upon us for he cares for us. Many of you have received, by way of religious teaching, an image of God in your mind and heart that causes you to see him as one who uses his power against you, as one who is looking for a reason to punish you. With his arms folded, looking over the balconies of heaven, perhaps this is how many of us imagine him, we see him looking down, barely putting up with us, tolerating us but not loving us, and this is how many believe God sees his creation. And we think that he's just waiting for the opportunity for us to mess up so that he can pour upon us his wrath. It's just the opposite. He's slow to anger, the Bible says. He's rich in mercy, compassion, patience. These are the attributes of God. Holding back wrath, not willing that any should perish. And as revealed in the Old Testament when he spoke to the nation of Israel, we see his heart, come now, let us reason together. All that he can do, he's done. Extending his reach to you now. The God of compassion. The God of love. The God of light. Yes, he is also holy. Yes, he is also just. Yes, the wages of sin is death. But God is withholding that wrath for as long as time will dictate according to his purposes. And he holds back that wrath, desiring that you would repent, desiring that you would turn to him. He is the gift giver, everything of life that we love, whether you find it in a spouse, in your love for your child, in your love for your friends, the joy of companionship, the experience of existence, everything you find in these things that is good or noble or pure or worth anything at all come from the nature of God, for he is goodness. He is the gift giver. He has given unto you breath. You may look around this world perhaps confused by your place in it, wondering what God has ever done for you. You may have gone through tragedy and wondered, where was God when I suffered? Where was God in my time of trouble? Where was God in that traumatic event? But again, we neglect to see the gifts of God given to us. You have breath, you have life, you have existence, you have time, you have a will. These are gifts from God. And if ever you wondered where God was, we are without excuse once we've heard the gospel. If ever you've wondered if God loves you, how do you know that this isn't him now speaking to you? I have loved you with an everlasting love. What if everything you've been through, everything you faced, every trial, every trauma has brought you to this moment now? God is faithful, the father of lights, and he gives you now a gift of truth. He's holy and just. When you reject God, you reject his goodness. God is life, light, goodness, the source of love, joy, and peace. When we live in a way that contradicts his nature, we live in darkness. And this is enmity with God. Living in that darkness makes you an enemy with God. James 4, 4 and 5 says this, You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think that the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful unto him. We see the holy jealousy of God. Yes, jealousy can be holy. Ungodly jealousy demands based on fear and selfishness. But godly jealousy sacrifices based on love and selflessness. God 
desires you jealously. Yet we fight him. All of us sin in some way. None of us measure up to God's holy standard. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 says, Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of God. Some might be offended at this idea of sin. But my friend, I would rather offend you into heaven than comfort you into hell. The Bible is still true. Sin is still sin. And if we're going to be faithful to the word, we have to preach against that sin. And I'm here to tell you that the wages of those sins, they're death. Destruction, darkness. That is perhaps one of the most loving things I can tell you is the truth. Truth is sin destroys. Sin robs you. Sin has a destructive power unlike any other. It corrupts your mind and body and soul. It wastes away your life and it puts you in direct enmity with God is goodness. Now imagine I were to give to you, let's just say for the sake of an analogy, a brand new sports car. How about a Lamborghini? Now I don't know what I would do with one. I probably wouldn't be able to know how to drive it. I'm not really a car person, but I think we all can understand the value of a sports car. And if I said to you, here's the gift, I paid it all in cash. Here's a card that will cover the fuel for the next 20 years. And I paid for all the insurance for the next 20 years. <laughs> and then I said, but there's just one thing. I want you to take care of it. Don't take it off-roading and obey the laws of the streets. The legal ones, not the um, illegal ones. Some of you were redeemed from the laws of the streets. <laughs> and I give you this vehicle, gas covered, insurance covered, everything paid off. And then you take those keys and you say, don't tell me how to use this car. How dare you? Who are you to put restrictions on me? Who are you to tell me how to drive what's mine? Well, this is what we do with our lives. God says, here is life. Here is goodness. Here is breath. Here is companionship. Here is love. Here is truth and light and joy and peace. And if you just live the way I tell you to live, you'll live in light. And people rebel against that, not realizing that their very ability to rebel, their will was given to them. That God sustains the very breath by which they curse him. And this is the stubbornness, the rebellion, the pride. And the effects of sin, though at first they may seem like they're non-existent, become more and more intense the longer you live in rebellion against God. Your heart becomes harder. You become cynical. You begin to view life through the lens of confusion. The life through the lens of pride. You end up with a lack of purpose, aimlessly wandering. You know, if there's no eternity, there's no purpose. Really think about that. If there's no eternity, there's no purpose for anything. Well, I want to be remembered by history. My friend, if there's no eternity, even history will be forgotten. Well, I want to live to better society and help develop mankind and take civilization to the new era of living, okay? You can do that, but if there's no eternity, eventually all civilizations come to an end. 
These are noble desires. There's nothing wrong with them in and of themselves. But without eternity, there's no real purpose. And so when you live without the eternal one, you live without him in your view, you live without him in your regard, now you're aimlessly wandering through life. What is my purpose? Why am I here? Why do I suffer? And there's a great emptiness that comes with that because you're living apart from the Creator. There's lack of joy and it cannot be found in the things of this world. Solomon, a wise man, the wisest who ever lived, the scripture describes him taking this experiment on. And in this experiment, he goes on to experience all that life has to offer. And every pleasure you can think of, every desire that can be fulfilled, he sought after it, and he had the wealth and the power and the status and all means to fulfill all desires that he had. And at the end of it all, he said, it's meaningless. You can search in the world. Do you know why the joy that this world brings is temporary? It's because everything that the world gives to you is itself temporary. Your joy can only last as long as that which it's based on. Think about this. You base your joy on money, and money begins to lose its allure. And you find that that number you wanted, once you get it, wasn't enough anyway, and you get lost in this desire, piercing yourself through with many sorrows. Like a thirsty man lapping up salt water. Only momentary relief to be then followed by an intensification of that desire. There's no joy in these things that last. And you may be sitting here feeling like a shell of who you were because after pursuing status, after pursuing finance, after pursuing every pleasure of this world you found, that you're still empty. There's a lack of peace. There's a lack of peace about life. There's a lack of peace internally, emotionally, mentally. There's the fear of death. My friend, you may not even realize that you're under demonic harassment. We as the saints of God, we resist the enemy, he flees. No fight, he flees. That's what the Bible says. Once we resist, he's like, I'm out of here. You know who you are, I'm leaving. But people of the world aren't even aware of the spiritual realm around them. They're living under the system of darkness. They're living under the influence of the enemy. And that brings harassment of the mind. That peace is robbed from you because of the guilt of things you've done. And maybe you're carrying guilt for something in your past. Maybe you're carrying guilt for some way you feel you failed. And that guilt weighs on you day and night. It's like a weight that you carry. And that burden becomes too much to bear. Lack of purpose, lack of joy, lack of peace. When God formed plant life, he called it forth from the ground. When God formed sea life, he called it forth from the water. When God formed animal life, he called it forth from the earth. When God formed you, he spoke to himself. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. You were formed of God from his spirit. The scripture declares that God breathed and man became a living soul. <laughs> Isaiah 59, 1 through 2, listen. The Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to hear you call. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away. And will not listen anymore. My friend, that is why sin destroys. Because sin separates you from God. Hear me now. You were not created 
to live in separation from God. You were not created to live in depression. You were not created to live with anxiety. You were not created to live with torment. You were not created to wallow in the filth of sin. You were not created to live in confusion. You were created to know God, to love Him and be loved by Him. It's who you are. It's why you were created. It's the purpose of your existence. This is why we rejoice for the scripture says in Colossians chapter 2 verse 13, you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature and you were cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all your sins. This my friend is the power of the cross. You want to know why you see Christians sometimes wearing those little crosses? You want to know why we talk about the power of the blood or the power of the cross or the sacrifice of Jesus? It's really simple. All of us have sinned. And all of us before Christ are living in rebellion against God. And the result of that sin is death. Here's the bad news first. Because you have to give the diagnosis before you can give the cure. Here's the bad news first. It's terminal. And there's nothing you can do about it on your own strength. You can go to church every single day. Give all your money to the poor. Volunteer at every charity. Never say another bad word for the rest of your life. And it still won't amount to the payment that we owe for even one sin. It won't even amount. We're helpless, utterly helpless without him. Now that's the bad news. The good news is Christ, who is God, and this is the gospel you need to hear. It's so simple. Yes, there are many different beliefs that come with Christianity. There are many different beliefs that come with following Jesus. We could talk about baptism and speaking in tongues and spiritual gifts and demons and spiritual warfare and the end times and the last days and Bible prophecy and genealogies and doctrines of all kinds. But the greatest truth I can share for you is simple. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And the gospel is simple. You can't save yourself. So Jesus, who is God, came to earth by the power of the Holy Spirit. The creator stepped into creation. Lived a perfect, sinless life. Not one sin, not one sinful thought, not one sinful attitude, no iniquity, no transgression, no abomination, nothing in him perfectly pure, the spotless lamb, meaning not a single blemish. And he lived this perfect life and then took the punishment for your sinful one. And when he died on that cross, it was the best that God had to offer, meeting the worst that man had to offer. It was God's mercy meeting your rebellion. It was God's compassion meeting your stubbornness. It was Christ's purity meeting your guilt. And on that cross when he died, he took upon himself the punishment for those sins. For the wages of sin is death. That's the reward for sin. You die. Jesus died upon that cross in your place. And now, if you'll only put your faith in him, believe it's that simple and I'll show you that in a moment. If you put your faith in him, then when God looks at you and when God looks at Jesus, it's much different. When you put your faith in Jesus and God looks at the cross, he sees your sin. And when he sees you, he sees Christ's perfection. It's the great exchange. The gospel is simply this. Jesus will give you his eternal life in exchange for your temporary one. You'll give it to him. 
You put your faith in him. It's all God requires. If it was any more complicated, we would ruin it. He lived the sinless life. He took upon the punishment of God. He took all power and authority from the enemy and all the powers of darkness. He is seated in heavenly places and all he asks of you, believe. That's it. And you may say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought I had to live clean. You do. But here's the difference. When you put your faith in Jesus, he begins to give you new desires. So then, I'm not living clean so that I'm accepted by God. That's, that's man's thinking. That's religion. And that'll torment you because you'll never know if you're actually saved or not. You'll never know if you actually did enough. So, so the way it actually works is, it's not that I live clean so that God accepts me. It's that I'm so thankful that God has accepted me. I'm going to live clean. It's done. Jesus said, Jesus said, it is finished. Not you take it from here. <laughs> Finish. Done. That's the cross. The cross says done. Religion says do, do, do. The cross says done, done, done. It is finished. First Peter 2, 22 through 25. He never sinned, nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. It's an ancient message that is still true. Sin is still the problem and Jesus is still the answer. There's no stain that cannot be cleaned. No sin so stains that the blood of Jesus cannot wash you completely clean. Romans 5, 1 through 2. Therefore, this is what the Bible says. Since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Romans 10 verse 9. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call upon him. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peace with God. Peace with God. That's why your heart is so heavy. It's why you're confused. It's why your mind is tormented. It's why you carry the shame. You're fighting God. All he wants to do is show you love. All he wants to do is show you truth. All he wants to do is give you himself. But you fight him. You fight him because of what religious people have led you to believe about him. You fight him because of someone who offended you, who claimed to be a Christian. 
You fight him because you see value in what is actually sin that's destroying you. You fight him because of one reason, and that's your pride. Why else would we reject the goodness of God? Why else would we reject eternal life? Why else would we reject Jesus? When salvation is so simple, it's pride. Repent of your sins. Turn to God and be cleansed. Repent of your sin and wrongdoing. Turn to Jesus and be saved. I know it's not popular to say it. I know people will get mad at me for saying so. But I have to warn you. Your sin is destroying you. And it's separating you from God. You need to turn from it. You need to turn from it. Today, the scripture declares that today is the day of salvation. Right now. We are without excuse. You may say, well, I don't believe in God. You're lying to yourself. Your conscience bears witness against you. That's not even a debate that needs to be had. You know the truth. That there's a God in heaven who formed you with a purpose. You may say, well, I've tried this before and I failed. And I don't want to fail again. My friend, you may fail, but he doesn't. He doesn't. He never fails. You may say, Brother David, there are things I've done that you don't even know, things I carry on my shoulders, memories that fill me with shame. Jesus died for the worst sins among us. There is no pit so deep that his love is not deeper still. Nothing can separate you from that love. So you're here this evening or you're watching online and you know that you need to respond to the message of the gospel. There's two ways that this can go tonight. You can choose to reject Jesus. And I say reject Jesus. You're not rejecting me. You're not rejecting a religion. You're not rejecting an organization. You're not rejecting a philosophy. When you reject the gospel, you're rejecting Jesus. We're not talking about religion. We're not talking about other people. We're talking about Jesus himself. And so this evening, God wants to save you. And you can choose to reject that message. And if you do, my friend, you will leave this place this evening carrying the weight and the burden of that sin and shame. And you'll leave this building, you'll get into your car, or you'll get into the subway or however you're getting home and you'll be sitting there tonight in your home still weighted by the sin still covered in the darkness saying to yourself I should have responded I should have responded I should have responded because you have to respond when God calls you we are not promised tomorrow He's saying, are you trying to scare me? I'm giving you the truth. And if the truth scares you, so be it. We are not promised tomorrow. You have to respond when he calls you. Or you can respond to Jesus. Give your life to him. He'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you. And the guilt and the shame and that weight that you've been carrying for so long will be lifted from off of your shoulders. You'll go home tonight 
with something in your heart that you can't quite explain, there'll be this joy, this peace, this, this overwhelming sense of connection with God that you can't even put into words. And I'm not promising you everything in your life will be perfect. If you're broke right now, you're going to go home and check your bank account. You'll still be broke. If you have issues in your marriage, sure, God can work on your marriage, but it's going to be where you left off when you get home. You have problems with your children. You have problems in this world, on the job. Whatever those issues are, they may still be there. Because Jesus said in this world, you'll have tribulation, of course. But you know what? You'll have a joy in your heart. You'll have a peace in your soul. And you'll know that you're connected with God. And you'll say, I'm so glad. I'm so glad I responded. Aren't you tired of running? Aren't you tired of fighting him? Don't fight him anymore. He's a wonderful Jesus. He's a wonderful Jesus. When you give your heart to the Lord and you place your faith in him, the only regret that you'll have will be that you didn't do it sooner. That will be it. Now, I'm not going to ask us to close our eyes. I'm not going to ask us to bow our heads. This is a public confession. Openly declare with your mouth, the scripture says. Jesus said, you deny me before man, I'll deny you before my father. You confess me before man, I'll confess you before my Father who's in heaven. You're in this place, and you know tonight that you have to respond to this message. You have to respond to the gospel, and you just want Jesus. I don't want you to think about it, because you already know what you need to do. I don't want you to look around the room and see, hey... How many other people are responding to this? I don't want you to look at your friends and say, guys, are we doing this? No, it's between you and God, you and Jesus now. If that's you, and you want Jesus, you want to turn from your sin and put your faith in what he's done on that cross. And right now, I want you to stand to your feet. And now, if you're standing, I want you to come down the aisles and come stand at the altar, please. Come to Jesus. Listen to what I'm about to tell you, because this is very important. If I do not properly communicate the gospel to you, God will judge me harshly. You cannot just say a prayer and be saved. There is no special password. There's no script to follow. Prayer, I'll say this. Prayer has never saved anyone. Prayer has never saved a single soul. Only Jesus saves. Not even prayer. Not even prayer. Only Jesus saves. And what I mean by that is simple. It's not a script that you can just read. It's not an incantation or a set of magic words. It's a confession that comes from the heart. And if it doesn't come from the heart, it's not a genuine confession. So this is not the end all be all. It's not as though you can just say the prayer and that's it. You're sealed. It's when you place your faith in him, truly, that you are sealed. And I do mean sealed, like he saves you. It's the finished work. But we have to recognize that it's something that we do based on our trust in him and him alone. So you say this prayer, yes. And if it's a genuine confession, if you are truly turning to him, He'll change your nature. That's the miracle of salvation. It's like going in for an operation. 
You don't pat yourself on the back and say, what a wonderful operation I did. You were asleep the whole time, hopefully. <laughs> Rather, you just have to have the faith to get on the operating table and say, do your work. That's all faith is. I can't save myself, but I believe you can. Here I am, please save me. And you put your faith in him, and then he goes to work. He's the surgeon of the soul. And he will transform your nature, your desires, everything about you. And then you serve him. Your desire will be to serve him. Your desire will be to live right. You may not get everything right, but he'll abide with you and you'll keep going. And it's a process to be more and more like Jesus. But it begins by putting your faith in him. Are you ready to do that? As I look across this crowd of faces, I see men and women, young and old, God is faithful. I see tears flowing. Eyes closed, I see hands lifted. I want you to think of the worst thing you've ever done. And this is not to shame you. I want you to think about it. That which troubles you. Now look at me. After today, it'll be as though that never happened. Not in God's book. Sins wiped away clean. Sins wiped away clean. Are you ready? When my daughter wants me to pick her up, she puts her hands out like this. So ask him to pick you up right now. Just put your hands in the air. And I want you to repeat this prayer after me. We read in Romans, confession with the mouth. There, there is no sinner's prayer in the Bible, but in the Bible you'll find sinners who pray. So repeat after me. Say, Dear Jesus, I come to you today believing that you are the Son of God. I ask you, Forgive me. Forgive me. Say it again sincerely to him. Forgive me. Forgive me. Of all my sins. All my sins. I, turn I turn from sin today. I turn from the world today. I turn from the devil today. And I turn to you. Jesus, Jesus. I, believe I believe you lived a sinless life. You died on the cross for my sins. You rose again in bodily form from the dead. I believe you're seated at God's right hand. Jesus, I put my faith in you. Save me. Change me. Free me. Jesus, Jesus, you are my God, are my, God. my Lord, my, Lord my, King, my King, my friend, my, friend, my, Savior. my Savior. And I declare, I declare today, today I, am I am now and forevermore, now and forevermore born, again born again in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen.